Good. Good morning, Mr. Craven. Ah, good morning, Mr. Martin. How are you? <laughs> I am extraordinarily well. I'm really excited to be speaking to you because, like I've already told you, I'm a little bit of a fanboy because I saw you um, way back when, like 14, 15 years ago, and you inspired me when I was a very young <laughs> marketing company. And um, I quoted you in my second ever What The episode when I was trying to define marketing because the marketing definition that you came up with is the best I've ever heard. And fortuitously, you came across that video, you commented, you got in touch, said it was great. You know, you saved me all the trouble of having to get in touch with you. So I am properly excited. This is the conversation I was hoping to have when I started these 18 episodes ago. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, man. A absolute pleasure. And it's actually one of those wonderful things about, about Tinternet. One of the good things is you find this randomness and these random connections you probably wouldn't otherwise find. It is one of the really great things about, about Internet, I think. Yes, I think it is. And I need to, and you need to remind me occasionally, because what I do most recently is I teach digital marketing and I teach it in a very conspiratorial way. So I teach my <laughs> students, that the first thing I tell them is I can't teach them digital marketing. But what I can do is like when you teach somebody to surf is you can teach them to be safe in the water. So I teach them very much. It's us versus the corporations. And I have to be reminded because I was working 20 years ago, 30 years ago, that before the internet, things were far harder than they are now. So I need to remember that from time to time. Well, I, I'm actually going to dispute that. I don't think they were harder. Um, so there you go. So that's a bit of, bit of upside down thinking. Because it's so easy to do it now, you know, because anyone can throw up a website with Wix because anyone can come up with a unique selling proposition because anyone can find some product, you know, everyone's everyone can be at it. Whereas, you know, 15 years ago, you had to work really hard. You had to, you had to have five or 10,000 pounds to have a website, absolute minimum. And I remember, you know, selling websites to, you know, to lawyers for like 40, 50,000 pounds. And they weren't, certainly weren't very sophisticated by by today's standards so so you know now you know if you want to find out who's the head honcho of your target company just go into linkedin press a few buttons see who you know knows them and boom you've actually got the connection whereas then it was like you know how do i how do i even know who's the head honcho do i i know i'll phone them and you get through to the reception and you say so who is the person in charge of marketing i should be talking to and the phone goes down. So, uh, you know, supply and demand tells me that there's like five times more people doing business and it's five times easier for them to actually make, make names, which means that there's just so much noise. I mean, just look at your LinkedIn or your Facebook feed and so how much blinking noise there is. And that noise wasn't there. You know, so I think there, it might have been in some senses a better time. Yes. Well, I've got a whole theories about the, the digitization of the world, of society, and whether it's a good thing or a bad thing or not. We've got into this, and we've got no idea if you're qualified to be speaking to us about marketing at all already. That's going to be my <laughs> first question. So what's the thing about that? I was there. Like, I graduated in 93, I think. And by the end of 93, I was in a, a media house in London, cold calling mm. people, trying to sell them advertising. So I was there doing the marketing and doing the, I haven't got a clue who is responsible for this and I need to find that person. Yeah. And I think you learn a lot about marketing that way and that's probably how I know about marketing. And I think people who weren't there don't necessarily know about marketing. Like in mm. digital marketing, they know where all the buttons are but they don't know where the actual levers are. 100%, you know I mean? 100%. so if you, ask, if you ask a typical marketer, how do you, how do you, how do you, who is your target customer? They say, well, we just, we just go into Facebook and we just just hit the button lookalikes. And it's like that's that's just getting a machine to do to do some of the lifting, and it's not necessarily accurate because the way they actually segment isn't the way that people actually are or behave. You know, we should be segmenting by people's behaviour, not by their not by their colour, age, what they last bought, and so on and so forth. Anyhow, we'll, we, I'm sure we can get on to get on let's, onto that. Let's go to that. Let's because there needs to be something. I'm going to start writing things down because this is going to get really. All right. Well, let's start off with what right have I got to talk to you about marketing? Which is absolutely. Your, which, is your, well, which is your question? What right? I think I think in some senses I have none, because uh, we all have L plates in this in this in this world, and so in some senses I have none. 
If you're going to go to qualifications, I've got a degree in economics and politics, that's totally irrelevant. I've got an MBA, that's even more irrelevant because they don't teach you anything about the real world at business school. Uh, you know, I spent 50,000 quid on business school. I learned, I learned two things really, which is one of which I use every single week, the other one I use once a month. The rest of it was just, this is how GCE, this is how British Telecom, this is stuff that, that very few people actually need with theories created in the mid 50s and early 60s about a world which isn't the world we live in now. So not a great deal of respect for that. Uh, I started marketing, I suppose, at the prime age of 13, Richard Buckman invited me to Petticoat Lane to help him uh, on his uncle's stall where we sold, sorry, I'll rephrase that, we gave away really expensive blankets and we sold really nasty sheets. Uh, and I used to stand at the back on a Sunday morning and there was his, it's like not five pound, not four pound, not three pound, not two, and all that kind of stuff. And I'd stand at the back with some money in my hand and every three minutes I'd put my hand up and go, I'll buy two. And I'd run to the front <laughs> collect these lousy sheets, <laughs> turn around, go back round to the back and do the same again. And I kind of learned more about, about psychology and what people buy and how to get people to buy and how to sell and how to win people's confidence there. I suppose that was my starting point. Um, first business, age 21, first proper business, age 21. Uh, which is a cafe, which became a restaurant, sound recording studio, pop festival catering, did loads of 10 years at Glastonbury, fell into consulting. Um, and it had always been marketing. It had always been how on earth can we get, you know, the, the restaurant was, you know, this is what we sell, but how do we get people in and how do we get the sort of people we want to come in to buy and how do we sell to them at a price? So I'd always been fascinated by the, the, the reality of selling more than in a way more than marketing and uh after my mba i was, I was so hacked off with the business school that i just phoned them up and said look um again another example of selling you know uh, I, I attended the mba it's really really interesting however the program on small businesses i felt could have been better because it didn't really deal with what i experienced as someone running a small business and they said well thank you very much for your comments but uh, Ian uh, was, was suffering from, from cancer when he, he did the program. And I said, okay, keep going. He said, well, actually, we're going to his funeral tomorrow. <laughs> so I said, I'll tell you what, I'm driving past this Warwick Business School. I'm driving past Warwick tomorrow, on, on Friday, which was a total lie. And let me come in and see you. And they had a bunch of programs they were trying to run. And I said, look, uh, you don't know what to do with these programs. Let me run them. And they said, what do you need? And I said, all I want is your logo. I will use people who've been there and done it to help people go there and do it. it. I don't, I'll give me a phone and give me a paying in book and that's all I need. And that became a thing called the business growth program for high performing businesses. And that's exactly what we did. We got people who've been there and done it to help people go there and do it. So the marketing expert was someone who ran a marketing agency had grown it. And the finance expert was someone who was an accountant, but he'd grown the business. So we didn't use any of their staff. We used their buildings uh, because we, we wanted people who'd been there and done it to help people go there and do it. And that's kind of been my philosophy ever since. So I did the, um, did the business growth program and we've run various programs getting bigger and bigger for more and more people. But that same basic principle that you want people, people on inverted commas on stage who've been there and done it. So they've got the spears in their back. And the real learning takes place side, side to side on the table. You know, how did you do it? How did you experience that? Does this work? Doesn't this work? What might you do? Let's talk about it when we meet up next time. So very, very kind of experiential. Um, and when I was at Warwick, uh, I cut a deal with Virgin Books. Uh, they wanted a business school to partner a book series. And, and that was a point at which I kind of became serious about it in a way where I said, okay, I'll, part of the part of the book series was I had two book titles. Uh, and then I started writing. And as a result of writing, this is a long winded explanation, suddenly, because there weren't people writing books all over the place, suddenly I was speaking on stages and people were listening to me. So that's kind of the short version. So what right have I got to talk about marketing? I've sold tons of stuff. I've run tons of 
failed marketing programs and tons of successful marketing programs. Uh, and still, every day I have to get up and find ways of, of selling our stuff. So uh, it's, a, it's a raw marketing piece. I wrote a book called Bright Marketing, which uh, was me really trying to get to, a bit like you were saying, Martin, about really trying to get to, get to grips with what marketing's about and what marketing really means. Um, but you could argue that it's, I certainly don't have the doctorates and the PhDs in marketing and I didn't work for Accenture or Ogilvy's or, or whatever it is. That's not the route that I took. Okay, so that's... A really long answer. I had no idea. Um, and it's interesting. I had no idea that it was so academic, your experience. Or no, no, I don't think it was academic. I think we used the platform of the business school to access people. So, so uh, all the people who came on the programs we ran didn't have degrees and they would take photos of themselves in front of the, you know, the business school sign because it was so funny that they'd... They'd gone, you know, there was, a, there was a truck company that had like, you know, 500 trucks. There was a, there was a, what else did we have? A, a refrigeration company. We had, you know, just proper, proper businesses that we were bringing together to help them accelerate their growth. And they just, and on the whole, at that time, they weren't all, certainly it wasn't, you know, formal let's show you the five P's and the seven R's and the 10 X's and this three by three matrix and all that bollocks. Good. Really good. So you weren't running these courses for students of the business school. You were no, running, no, them, we were running them for real businesses. Yeah. yeah. yeah we went out, into the teams. We went out and funnily okay. enough, just yesterday I threw away all the brochures. You know, that thing when you kind of go through all your files and go, I think, I think it's time to throw these brochures away. <laughs> it's like, okay. All right, so this is really, okay, this is really interesting. So what you did is you just leveraged the brand of the business school and marketed yes. directly to... Okay. 100%. And, and I'll tell you the really interesting thing about that is, is pre-business school I was doing consulting and you, you pick up the phone and say, hi, Robert Craven Consulting, can I help you? Phone goes dead. Hi, Robert Craven Consulting, can I help you? Phone goes dead. Go to Warwick Business School. Hi, Warwick Business School, small business centre. Yeah, how can I help you? The boss would like to talk to you. <laughs> and, 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 and selling became really, really easy because selling was like, I mean, it was literally, you used to invite people in for these taster evenings. It was really exciting. I had, I'd never, I, when I arrived there, I didn't know how you sold with a brand, if that makes sense. I didn't understand that people knew about you and you didn't have to educate them and say, hi, this is what I do. And we arrived, and, 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 and it was, it took me two or three months to realize, you know, when you sell BMWs, you don't say, hello, this is a BMW. It's the ultimate driving machine. It's a blah, 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 Because people know what a BMW is, and if they don't, they won't buy it. And the same thing happened at Warwick, that you'd invite people in, show them the premises, give them some, some tidbits to eat and some glasses of wine. And then what I used to do is get X uh, attendees of the program from last year's program to present about the programme. I used to go to the bar, I don't know if there were anyone even knew this, I used to go to the bar and I used to drink two pints of Guinness, literally, and leave potential clients with existing clients to talk to each other, okay? And that yeah. way they could, have, they could ask all the questions they wanted, discuss all the things they wanted, who, what was good, what was bad, what did, what didn't work. And then I just used to walk in with an order book, you know, and just, and just take orders. They, my, the existing clients were ambassadors and they did all the, the heavy lifting of the selling for us. It was a really interesting exercise in, in selling. So it was, and I literally just said, here's a program at £6,000, run over 12 months, blah, 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 blah. Sign here. Fantastic. Okay, good. Because marketing was happening and I'm with you, I think. I came from sales. I also did a, politics, they called it, by the time I was at university. Yeah. So I had a politics degree, which went towards kind of philosophy. So that was interesting. And I think semi-useful because you're talking about motivations and things. Yeah, yeah. And then I went into sales and yeah. then I went into marketing only because I'd spent 10 years in sales and my reasoning was I'd seen the marketing people lord it up with all of the budget and none of the target, whilst the salespeople had all of the target and none of the budget. Yeah. And then I came to marketing and only then in my mid-30s, I learned the kind of lessons that you're talking about now. Mm. 
My question for you is this, because what I've done recently is teach digital marketing, which is, yeah. which is a special kind of torture, um, because it changes all the time. Somebody at Google decides they're going to change something. No, 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 it doesn't change all the time. I mean, just, okay. just go back, just, just go back to 1961, and I will be academic. The one piece of academia I will quote for you is 1961, Theodore Levitt wrote an article in, Mar in Harvard Business Review called Marketing Myopia, right? And he says in it, and, and, I, and I've lived, lived on the, the shoulders of great people, he's the great person I've lived off, and he said, people think marketing is all about tactics, you know, Facebook this, Facebook that, or lookalikes, or, and it's not. He says, and then people say, oh, if it's not about tactics, it must be about strategy, because we like using the strategy word. And he said, Marketing is not about strategy. He said, marketing is all about the customer. Yeah. And, and this myopia of thinking it's about my product and what my product does and how people can benefit from my product is, is entirely wrong. You know, that marketing is all about, it's all about the customer. It's not about me. It's not about my product. It's not about my features and benefits. You know, it's, it's about, you know, why should they bother to buy my product when they can buy someone else's? It's about, it's about, uh, you know, people don't my, buy my product. They, you know, they buy my product, not for what it does, but they buy my product for what it does, what it does for them, you know? And, and, and it's, and it's, it's, it's really fundamental. And the other thing he said, and we can probably finish the interview now, no way, is he said that marketing is just about two things. It's about, segmentation in other words who the hell are you selling to and it's about differentiation which is what makes me different from the rest you know and if you can and if you can nail segmentation you know we sell to lawyers with between 50 and 150 desks who have a problem understanding how to grow their sales differentiation and what makes us different is we're faster than the competition and brighter and friendlier and nicer you know cut the two in half boom there you are off you go. And, and I think that this whole, I think people have just lost sight of, of how blinking simple it is. It, it's, you know, customer is king, whatever you want to want, however you want to describe it. It's, it's about what hurts, problems, needs, itches, scratches the customers got and how can we sort them out for them? Okay, good. Perfect. I'm really, I'm really pleased to hear you say that because this is essentially how I get away with teaching digital marketing because I teach the principles of marketing and how you can leverage those using digital platforms. That's kind of what I do. Yeah. Because, and I'm agreeing with you 100%, so we're not going to have an argument. Jim? The issue with digital marketing is that digital marketing isn't necessarily about the customer. Digital marketing isn't necessarily about... Um, it's about digital. It's about Google, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, TikTok, whoever else wants to come to the party and where the buttons are because digital marketing is not necessarily about marketing. I think that's the issue. It's created a whole soap opera which is about it. So the, the issue with teaching digital marketing, I think, is academically is that by the time you've put together curriculum by the time you've got it approved okay. by the time you've put together the exam questions then some geek at google has changed the way things work i don't know what it might be ppc or whatever it might yeah, yeah, be but I, I, and it I doesn't still work like that anymore yeah but i so so that's certainly about the delivery so in terms of the delivery it's like and and, and you know and we and we saw that we saw that on covid how how i mean if we did this in if we did this interview um a year and a half two years ago pre-covid we'd have probably done it on do you remember skype you know yes. skype was was what the platform that everyone was on a year and a half ago and it's vanished it is i don't even know if skype exists anymore i can't remember the last time i used skype so so 100 it's about Oh, the algorithms changed. Oh, they now penalizing you for this. Oh, that's the, the kind of deliverable. But, but my argument is, is that most agencies are too, a, a bit like what, um, what, what Levitt's saying, they're too preoccupied with the, with the tactics. In other words, 
Do we put it on TikTok? Do we not put it on TikTok? Is it 30 seconds or 60 seconds? Do we have a video? How many people do we have? Versus, versus the bigger principle, which is, you know, what is, what is our customer's problem and how can we help them deal with it? And one of the really interesting things in COVID is the agencies that, that did really well, sweeping generalizations, so I apologize to all the people I'm upsetting. The agencies that did really well kind of went back to basics, which was what is it our clients really want right now? And what their clients really wanted is they wanted to keep the customers they had, slow down the customers that were leaving or, or get more customers. So those agencies realized that, the, that their job was to help their clients do that. Not necessarily via PPC or Facebook advertising or new websites, but they recognized that their, their role had become to help their clients navigate through difficult times. The agencies that did really poorly sweeping generalization were the ones that said hello we are a ppc agency and we specialize in ppc with google and this is what we have to offer you because they 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 weren't able to lean in to what it was that the customer really wanted and 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 that that is a, a myopia they believed that the only thing they could sell was ppc and search or the only thing they could sell was you know, Facebook advertising or being advertising, whatever it is. And, and customers don't wake up in the morning and say, I want more PPC. They wake up in the morning and say, I want more better customers. Show me how to do that. So the challenge becomes, you know, do you let the tail wag the dog? You know, when the customer turns up and says, we'd really like an email marketing campaign to go with our PPC campaign. Do you say, no, we are a PPC campaign. We cannot help you. Or do you go either we've got a sister company and we'll we'll take ownership or oh that's interesting that's the third inquiry for email marketing we've had this week it sounds to us like what our customers really want is ppc and email marketing and they fit together really well so so i'm going to quote theodore levitt back at you in a way that it's that yes it's yes, tactics make it incredibly difficult. And I would hate to be setting the syllabus for an exam that's being being delivered in a year's time or six months time or three months time or one month time. But it's but the, the problem for agencies is understanding who their client is and what their clients hurts, needs, it scratches, wants are. Good. You're saying everything I believe. You're saying everything that I tell people all the time when I'm teaching. My, my interest is in, because I think digital is particularly difficult because it's run by these four corporate monoliths who will change Agreed. something and it, it changes globally and there's no Agreed. feedback mechanism and there's, there's nothing that Agreed. goes on. I think that is difficult and I think the danger is if you are a exam board, you'll want to ask questions about where the buttons are, etc. and the buttons are constantly moving. So I think that's more difficult. I th what I'm interested in is your comment about your MBA, where you you were dissatisfied to the point that you went back and said, "I'm dissatisfied." Yeah. My question is: Is it actually possible to teach marketing academically? <laughs> what a great question! Um, is it possible to teach marketing academically? I believe. I you... Go on. Sorry, I mean, I don't have to, if you're happy to answer the question. Yeah, yeah no, 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 I think I it's a great qualify question. Qualify it a little bit more, yeah, okay. Uh, I, 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 so, so the answer is yes. I think the way it's taught at the moment is wrong. Isn't it ironic that marketing has marketed itself so badly, I and mean, there's a blog in its own right, that people don't understand the value of marketing because marketing has singularly failed. Because as my daughter said, she worked for market, used, to, used to work for a marketing agency in, where was it? In, in London, in one of the cool, funky places, Farringdon, you know, marketing is is getting people to buy shit they don't really want. And I mean, it's a, it is quite a cynical, it's quite a cynical, cynical view, people getting people to buy shit they don't really want. Um, but I think that that uh, the basics of marketing can clearly be taught. Okay, that sense of who is a customer, what does the customer want with and, and I've worked with the wonderful uh, um, Professor McDonald at uh, Cranfield, I mean, for the last 
10, 15 years I've been working with, with him. And you know, he wrote the original mar marketing something book, marketing. And, and, and it, it's just very, very straightforward. It's about, about you know, what is the product? What are the features? What are the benefits? Why should people buy it? What are the advantages? What's our customer strategy? What are the customer tactics? What are we going to measure? How are we going to make it happen? And the difficult bit gets in your digital piece where we go down into these tactics. So I think that marketing, marketing, marketing can be taught in the sense that the tools, techniques, and the levers that you pull can be taught. Can the um, the no the marketing nose be taught? I think probably not. You know that sense of I know one or two people in marketing. I'm thinking of one guy particularly I work with, and he he can look at anything and he will see how it can be presented in a way that that satisfies deeply satisfies a customer need want her her scratch and he just has a he has a skill of 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 saying okay i understand you're selling whatever it is a cup or a mug but i think the particular people would be particularly interested in your type of mug would be these people for this and therefore the way we could present it would be this and therefore that and he's and he's like a magician in a way and uh so that i think is harder to learn that kind of the creative side of it but i think the technical side of it yeah sure and i think the interesting thing of course is we've got you know uh militant ppc on on this side you know which is all people with very very pointy heads uh and then on on the on on, on the other far side we've got full service agencies where, where they're all wearing their black versace jumpers and their and their Yves Saint Laurent jeans and they're doing kind of brand and creative stuff um yes. and there's, there's there's quite a lot of confusion about about who's doing the, the real marketing um but i think can marketing be taught in yes is the business school the right place to teach it yes and no business schools are wonderful for standing up in front of a board and being able to talk to any director in the boardroom because you know the models, you know the systems, you know the processes. Um, small business marketing, that's tougher, isn't it? Yes. That's tougher. Okay, so I love your marketing nose, but it comes close to the other danger, I think, which is mm -hmm. this idea that really perpetuates which is that there is some kind of trick there's one trick to marketing or you're going to collect your marketing knowledge in nuggets and if you're lucky enough to to find those nuggets then you might be successful so which i think is the other danger and i'm somewhere in between the two it's not an academic thing but also it's not a trick you know it's there are principles yeah. that need to apply so not very, not a million miles away from you, the way you describe the activity of marketing. I tell my students that marketing is about landing the right message on the right person at the right time. Yeah. And Brackets profitably. Profitably, yes, thank you. So it has to be profitably because I yes. can sell, what I, the one thing I learned at, at Petticoat Lane is if you're selling something for a penny, you can sell tons of them. It's not difficult selling stuff. It's not difficult. What's clever is selling it for 50 quid. Yes, yeah? and actually so, making your profit. So, so I don't know, the, 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 you know, the trick isn't... Um, is you know, it a trick, a though? That's what we're it, trying to establish it, first. Well, it's, it's not a trick. Well, it's... Here's a pair of glasses. It, 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 these could be, you know, one pound at the pound shop. They could be... Uh, 50 quid at spec savers they could be 250 pounds at you know robert craven optometrist for the senior people now as long as i'm delivering value at all levels that 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 kind of doesn't matter as long as the clients are kind of happy it, it is not necessarily a trick because at 250 pounds i might spend like a day of my time you know fixing and measuring and, and adjusting and so on and so forth so so it's 
I think the thing is that marketing gets confused with kind of that ad man stuff of we'll drink brandy and smoke cigarettes and then we'll come up with a cunning plan to fool people. It's not about, to me, it's not about coming up with a cunning plan to fool people. It's about, about finding ways to give people what they want, you know, and if, if, if people want to spend 250 quid on a PCR test because they don't want to do it through the NHS, you know, the National Health Service, that's, that's fine. So it's about, you know, it's about how we, how we, how we play with that. But obviously, it can be abused. Good. All right. And I think the reason that all of this is so confusing, because exactly like you say, marketing is appalling at selling itself. Yeah. It should be much, much better. Like we can define it in simple terms, like really simple terms, really, really simple terms and make it a common sense thing. For me, the whole of business is marketing. The whole of business is, to go back to the definition that you gave in 2006, 2007, whenever it was, it's about finding, winning, and keeping customers profitably. If you yeah. are doing that, then you are in business. And if you're not doing that, you're not going to be in business for very long. But people don't do that because they don't know that's what they're supposed to be doing, I think. You know, is and that has to be the fault of marketing the the community that p small businesses especially big businesses of course they know how to do this they know they're doing this all day every day but small businesses don't know that and it and if, if marketing is identifying a need and satisfying that need yeah then why isn't marketing this gets very meta i think but why isn't marketing very good at doing that because it's full of itself um i think <laughs> is the answer I think it's, it's, it believes it's something really special, doing something really profound. They believe they're saving the world by getting people to buy more frozen food, you know, and, and they're not saving the world. I mean, it's, it's, it's a great job to have, don't get me wrong. And it's, it's, it's good for the frozen food company and it's good, good business and everyone's happy, but, but they're, they're not necessarily saving the world. There are, better ways of saving the world than doing cute ads for frozen food. So, um, but they are, you know, let's also give marketing some, some, some respect. They also, marketing people also have the opportunity to, to communicate really important ideas to people. You know, it was, I would argue, actually, no, this is going to be really cumbersome. I would argue that as we look at the way in which governments have been communicating about uh, about covid that's been that's been a marketing exercise on the whole it's been it's been how do we persuade i mean they would argue it's pr but it's how do we get people to do this stuff how do we how do we target specific audiences who may be averse to having jabs and how do we reach them and persuade them of the benefits and get them and make the sale and make and making the sale equals getting people to put jabs in their arms so, so, you know, marketing or, you know, marketing for charities or, or, or the way in which, uh, um, you know, the issues around climate change have been taking place. These are all, I would argue, these are all, I, mean, I know you'd say it's PR, but it's really just marketing about understanding how to nudge people, understanding how to get people to do what you want them to do, which is what marketing you know, is about in a way. Absolutely. I'm 100% with you. The conversation I had two chats ago was with Melanie Farmer. Melanie Farmer's involved um, in Australia. She's been involved in essentially marketing their COVID response. She's kind there you of go, yeah. always been positioned inside um, universities. Okay. Um, and, and for me, 100%, it's a marketing campaign, you know, to get people to respond the way that they want to, them to respond to stay at home not stay at home go to work not go yeah, to work yeah. have the jab not have the jab yeah. so for me it's always about marketing and what's interesting about that is i think that the the science i think the reason it's so difficult if it's difficult i don't know i know a huge majority of people in the uk have had the vaccine now yeah. but where they're getting resistance is because of a lack of credibility yeah. in 
the politicians and in yep, the yep. science and in the pharmaceutical companies. So that comes back to what you were saying about the business school, which is if you have the right association, it all it all gets much easier. Okay, yeah. good. We're coming close to what you're busy with now, I think, are we? So you're okay. running a some kind of agency community, agency service. Yeah. What yeah, is okay. that? What, what is okay, that so I, is that so what is it? What is it? So digital agencies. Uh, we have a Facebook group for fifteen hundred digital agency owner founders. We have a subscription based portal with monthly updates and interviews with people like Tom Peters and Rand Fishkin and all kinds of people, which is paid before you enter. And essentially, we do we do we do three things. I mean, our, our thing is we help agency owners run the agency they really want to run. Why? So they can live the life they really want to lead. So if they want to row across the Atlantic, we'll help them do that. If they want to sell their agency for 10 million, we'll help them do that. And we kind of do that three ways. One-to-one -one work, you'd call that coaching or consulting or mentoring. I'm not really too hung up on which phrase we use, the right hat at the right time. Uh, One-to-few, that's mastermind groups. Uh, and then one to many, which is coaching and sorry, which is training and, and keynotes. So the message, you know, the DNA, the message is pretty much the same wherever you go, whoever you talk to within the organisation. But it's 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 not the techniques that your students get examined on that we that we're interested in. We're interested in how do you how do you run and grow an agency. So it's far more about the agency's strategy, the agency's marketing the agency's teams the agency's leadership the agency's finance okay cool so is there some irony here if okay. you are having to be an agent for these agencies or, or um, not? Well, there is an irony. There's always an irony when someone sets up a, some kind of a network to represent. I mean, my my kind of our value system is, is, is kind of around these agencies could be doing so much better and these agencies could be seen so much better. So let's help them be seen to do better and be seen to be better than they are. That's kind of we're trying to move, move the perception of the industry. That's kind of where we're at. That's what we want to do. Uh, they don't have time to do it themselves. You know, the usual stuff, they're too busy working in the business and not enough time on the business. And they're too busy looking after their own agency to not worry about the industry. Um, and ironically, the industry doesn't understand what they do because, because if you take, you know, Google, LinkedIn, Facebook, whoever it is, they, it's not it's not a fair partnership you, you know so so they don't understand the needs of the individual agency so it's an interesting dynamic there okay good why did you did you just answer the question why you decided to put this together for specifically for no Marvel no i didn't no i didn't i didn't answer it so so the CV goes, ran the, ran the course at Warwick, upset everyone at Warwick, left Warwick, set up on my own uh, a consultancy. Uh, in about 2000, I've been involved in a consultancy. We've grown to about 50, uh, a digital agency. We've grown to about 50, 55 people. Um, and then in the 2014, 15, 16, realized that nearly all our clients were marketing, marketing agency, graphics artists, web design. Same time, Google approached us to ask us to help them put together a program for premier partner digital agencies. Same time, an agency in the States asked us to work on some research that would inform a program which we didn't realize at the time was actually the same program. And then 2016, we launched that program for Google premier partners, 32 countries, yada, yada. Um, book, Grow Your Digital Agency came out and then we said, you know what, legacy clients, you know, this is what we want to lean into. These are the people we like, P partly, Martin, because of all the problems you said earlier on, you know, that, that, it, that digital agency land is different because the algorithms are changing so rapidly. That does make them a unique one. Secondly, they tend to be really young minded people. 
Thirdly, they tend to be really bright people. And, and those are my people, don't let anyone know about it, more than, more than accountants or lawyers, you know. I'm willing to okay. uh, go over burning coals for these people. Okay, so I don't know because I've only ever run a marketing agency. I've run one business in my life and it's a marketing agency. So I, I have no frame of reference, but I get yeah. the sense that running a marketing agency is a special kind of torture. It seems to me that it must be more difficult. I've got no experience, but just because it was so freaking difficult. <laughs> that, um, you know, it, our marketing is a marketing agency, a specifically difficult type of business to run. You could, you could take almost anything I say, you know, so the books grow your digital agency. You could almost, you know, do a cut, paste, search, cut, so search, cut, paste, of digital marketing agency and put accountancy practice or architects practice or whatever in it, because it's because it's in many ways, it's all the same stuff, which is where the hell are we going strategy? How on earth are we going to sell this stuff marketing? Why can't we get on better teams? Where am I taking this place? And why should people listen to me leaderships? How much are we making? You know, finance money. So those things exist. Those are the nuts and bolts of running any business, whatever it is. There's then the specific, I think, of it being service. So in other words, it's not consumable and when it's gone, it's gone. You know, I think that's really important. So, so we can't, as an agency, we, we haven't got an inventory behind us of stuff on the whole. Uh, and secondly, we're trying to help other people to do, to do what they're trying to do, which is this sense of kind of consultancy agency which I think a lot of people don't really quite get so is it harder I think if you if you had a dining room with like 20 business owners you know with a cocktail bar company a marketing agency a camera shop a portrait artist a pottery I think they're all pretty much as difficult as each other because they've got their own their own sort of things going on i mean you know i wouldn't like to be a wedding a wedding venue right now for instance you know no okay so i think i was i was laughing just to see how many different types of businesses you could you could name if you could actually get to 20. physiotherapist psychotherapist <laughs> of course you can publisher so, so I, I think the thing that makes the the thing the irony is well the thing that makes i think running a marketing agency difficult is that especially if you're t if you're working with small businesses is that you are working with the hopes and dreams of those business owners Agreed. you know so it's not as different from accountancy where everybody knows at the end of year you need compliant accounts to go in or it's different from working well with see, see i wouldn't agree with that that's not the job of an accountant see the job of an accountant uh and there are a few who do it really well i've got one of them but the, 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 the job of the accountant is to help their clients have better lives. It's like this. It's like this. Why do you do what you do so that it's this benefit thing? The accountant, you know, is there to do your accounts so that you can live the life you really want to lead. My accountant should be asking me, your accountant should be asking you, what is it you want to do with your life? When were you thinking of retiring? You know, how much time do you want to spend with your kids? Are there things you'd like to do, like travel around the world? OK, let's make that happen. Yeah, but most accountants, you've got me on accountants now, most accountants say, oh, all right, yeah, we're, we're, we're going to count your numbers and, we're, and, and, and they don't add any value. And because they don't add any value, they, they, they get a bad name for themselves. But a great modern thinking accountant is there to transform the lives of their clients. And, okay. and, and, and likewise, digital agencies are there to transform the lives of their clients. It's about about... God, you know, I hate Simon Sinek and I hate people talking about purpose, but it is about, you know, what are we there to do? If you're just there to count the numbers and take the money, you know, you're a boring accountant. But if you're there to really connect and engage with your client about how you can help them get what they want. And I think the same thing applies to a digital agency. You know, we go in and we say, what is it exactly want? I want this. I want I want to hit sell a million units. I I want to be able to sell this business in in five years for 10 million pounds because this product number one is is consistently number one in its niche okay we can help you do that but it's not okay 
yeah, it's not just, just about the numbers. Okay, so the thing is, this is really uncomfortable for me because you and I think exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the way the world thinks. Yes, correct. So the way the world thinks is that accountants are essentially a compliance facility Agreed. in your business to make sure you don't go to prison for not paying enough tax or not getting things in on time or doing those things. So the, the motivation of the buyer of accountancy is a need. Every business knows they need, they need accountancy. But they can get that for they can get that for five dollars an hour from Bangalore. The the, the added absolutely. value. But they are absolutely going to buy that service, whether yeah. they spend five dollars on it or they spend five hundred pounds an hour. They yeah. are going to buy that service. Now every business should know that they need marketing in their business, and they should be prepared to to buy marketing. It's about finding, winning, and keeping customers profitably. It's about being in business. Yes. But they don't know that. So I'm with you. Accountants could offer far more value. When I was running this business um, properly, I went through an accountant a year for eight years because I was <laughs> shocked at, that they weren't adding value to my life. Yeah. They were sending me emails in red letters and block capital letters. So I'm with you 100%, but it's not the way the world thinks. Like the world doesn't think like us. If the world thought like us, it would be much easier running a, a marketing agency. But they <laughs> don't get what it is. They don't understand the value. They don't understand that actually, literally, like an accountant could make your life better. A, a marketing agency, its whole reason d'etre is to make your life better. Yeah. You know? I, I mean, I, I totally agree. And, 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 and the, the, the part of the failure is is ironically, hugely ironically, me to me to advertising, me to marketing by the agencies themselves, you know? You, yes. I'd tell you, um, you know, three, two or three stories, very, very quick. First one, I'm at a, a conference for digital agencies dealing with the customers. There are 30 stalls all the way down. Every stall is identical. Every stall has people either climbing up ropes, pulling ropes, or climbing up trees on a picture behind them. Every stall has a young, very, very pretty girl with a very flimsy blouse on, uh, and that's not sexist, it's just an observation of the fact, who walks up to you, shuffles up to you in her high heels and says, can I help you? And you say the same thing to every one of them, which was, hi, I'm running a professional service firm, I really like help with my marketing. Tell me, what makes you different from the rest? And they say, blah, blah, uh, we deliver value for money, and what makes us different is our, our, our obsession with customer service. Every single one of them said the same bloody thing. Every single one of them, all 30 of them, until I came to number 31, which is a grey-haired man, looked a bit like you with a beard and stuff. And he said, tell me, tell me about more about your business and your experience with, uh, with digital agencies and why you're looking for a new one. Because my proposition to you is we, 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 you, you need to tell us what you want from your agency, how many sales you want. And if we don't deliver, we won't charge, charge you. And if we do deliver, we'll charge a fee which is agreed in advance. It's like, bloody hell, you know, 30 of them, total fails, one of them, you have my money. And it's about, so it's about not understanding. The, the problem, the problem for digital agencies is they sell the same product to the same people using the same websites, the same selling techniques, because they employ the same people who've been to the same universities, using the same tools and the same techniques and the same price points and the same leverage points in order to sell the same stuff to the same people. It is so incredibly beige out there. All the agencies look and feel and sound identical. They have failed in marketing 101, you know, absolutely. And not only they failed in marketing 101, but they've kind of failed the industry by, by not smoking their own dope not whatever the phrases you want to use okay i like smoking your their own dope okay so this is really interesting because why is it because it comes back to what you were saying before about the agency only wanting to be a ppc agent agency so why do so 
my issue in my life, or when I think about these things, I don't, I th don't think about it often. It doesn't keep me awake at night. But my issue is why don't businesses understand that they need marketing? And the answer is because they don't understand what marketing is. Agreed. And it, what sounds, it sounds like what you're saying to me right now is that marketing agencies don't understand what marketing is. So if a marketing agency, and you said this, and I heard this in 2007, 2008, so it's been around for at least 14 years, I can't imagine you, ca you cooked it up for us that day, you've been telling the world that marketing is about finding, winning, and keeping customers profitably for at least 14 years that I know of. Why isn't that the standard? Why don't the people who do this full time marketing agencies employ people to do it why aren't they saying that to their customers because i failed <laughs> i have you failed, failed or they fa <laughs> <laughs> well i failed because obviously i've not managed to get the message out there well enough against it's but but maybe maybe you know if the analogy is like pop music maybe it's okay because it's a cult it's a small it's a small it's a small offshoot of people who know what's really good against the nonsense that's out there. Now, what drives me mad is, is that marketing has got such a bad name as a consequence of a 30 second story. Woman said, can I come, can I see her? I said, well, I'm driving past the door. I go and see her. She invested £70,000 of her redundancy fee in a website, okay? She'd given £20,000 to the web designer, she'd given £10,000 to the graphics designer, she'd given £10,000 to the digital marketing person, she'd given £10,000 to the copywriter. And it was a rubbish, rubbish idea. It was a rubbish proposition. Nobody told her because they all wanted their money, okay? And it was an absolute disgrace that they'd taken 70000 quid from her. And any half decent person like you and me, Martin, would have said, this is a really interesting idea you've got here. Before we go any further, I think you just need to test that proposition. Like maybe we could just, just test it very lightly to see what kind of response you have. But no, everyone just wanted their 10,000 quid for their bit of the work. And nobody, nobody took ownership about the fact that they were helping the woman lose her home absolute disgrace you know and it and it brought tears to my eyes so so we have you know selfish freelancers in all different fields and areas who are preoccupied in their own problem not looking at it holistically not seeing it as part of marketing you know uh where are we now where are we going how are we going to get there how does my bit fit in um and yeah, and the industry is riddled with those kind of stories, which we kind of, and then we wonder why marketing gets a bad name. Yes, and I don't think it's necessarily freelancers. I don't know the last no. time you pitched I mean, for a client or if yeah. you ever pitched for a client, but the way it goes, and the last time I pitched for a client was in 2013, 2014, so the world might have adjusted mm -hmm. itself. But essentially the way it goes is if you're me, you go in and you pitch them and you say, look, I've done some research. I've looked at the, the sort of keywords that people are searching for and the volumes. And I've looked at, you know, how much noise there is around this on Twitter. And I've looked at kind of the attention that some of the YouTube videos have got. And this is kind of what I would imagine is going on. And this is what I would imagine it's going to cost you to win a customer and all of this good stuff. But if you're the sixth person in, they've already mm. spoken to five people who have bullshitted them about without thinking about any of that stuff just oh yeah we'll, we'll have you number one in google in three weeks time you so know, we have to like, go back so we have to go back to the basics martin which is why should people bother to buy from you when they can buy from the competition when the competition are faster smarter brighter cheaper friendlier so it's about that proposition and it could well be that you're not right for them it could well be that they want a a, a cheap cheerful solution when you're the when you're the five star it could be that they want a mini but you're the you're the the audi or the mercedes benz and that's cool and that's fine but it's but because all customers are not born equal and and all customers are not right for us so i think so i think uh that's the first thing second thing is uh we've just run a program on on pitching uh, uh, based on a program we ran a year before for senior directors on pitching, and people are shocking at it. Okay, they're just 
they can't do it. They can't, they can't, they can't, it's still, everyone is still, I've just been with an agency, they showed me five of their, their pitch decks. The shortest one was 81 slides, you know, and the first 10 are about us. I don't care about, don't they understand the world's moved on? I've Googled you, I know who you are, I know what your work is off your website. I only want to know one thing as a customer, which is, which is, in short, how much is it going to cost and what am I going to get? Yeah, so just, just tell me that, please. So why isn't the opening? Hello, I'm from ABC. We believe that we can get you 100,000 clicks per month and it's going to cost you 10,000 pounds. Now let me explain how we can do that. Now you can expand on that with intrigue frames and I'm not going to go into, into the detail of it, but, 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 but most proposals are the same proposal that you saw five or 10 years ago. They've just cut and pasted the proposal from the agency they worked at and they think that's the right way of doing it. You know, they don't go in, they don't phone up the day before they do the proposal saying, we're going to come to see you tomorrow to do the proposal. Just, just to be clear with you, it's going to be 10,000 quid a month for 100,000 clicks. Is that what you were looking for? And so that the client can say, well, actually, we thought YouTube advertising would be nice as well. You, there's a process about, about pitching. So yes. to answer your question, if there's six people in the room, do you really understand what the client really wants? So we're back to advantages of working with us, why we're, why we're different, why we're better. Um, and even more, you know, you know the, the work is won before we get to the proposal. So let's have a look at your, let's have a look at your website, matey. What is, what is the question? What are the questions that clients ask themselves? The questions that clients ask themselves, which are not on your website, by the way, are how much is it going to cost? What might go wrong? How else can I get this result? Yeah. Who else should I be talking to in this field? And what are the advantages, the disadvantages of working with them? And tell me some stories about people you've worked with as at the top. So why don't you, Mr. Digital Agency, why don't you put that on your website? Oh no, you say, oh no, Robert, we can't do that. We'll do it when we have the one-to-one. -one. But don't you get that if people don't get answers to those questions straight away on your website, they're gonna go somewhere else. If I've got to figure out whether you're a, an agency that wants to work with me with my my small ten thousand pound budget, and you know, and then someone else says our fees are between five and twenty thousand pounds a month, I'm going to stay with that one. And the other thing is, you're starting to imprint on the potential client your values, how you work, how you talk by answering answering the questions that your customers have. And yet, you know, we've done loads of research on on agency websites, 95% of them are pants. Here's the dog. We were founded in 2010. We've got over 500 years of experience as an agency. Here's a list of our clients. I mean, it, it, it doesn't match, you know, what, what, the, what the client wants, which is, okay, what you do for me. Good, good, right, <gasps> two things. <laughs> Firstly, I we we did okay. We won enough pictures, so I'm not sure. bitching about this. No, and, that, it, and it was 15 years ago, where, 10 years ago. Yeah, so yeah, it got to the point where I was sitting in front of a client one time, and he said to me, Martin, what do you understand? What you need to understand is that you will slide a lot further on bullshit than you will glass. And what he was effectively saying to me was lie to me. Everyone yeah. else is lying to me. So nobody's going to get you to the top of Google in three weeks' time by any means that is going to be sustainable, you know, so or good for your long-term business. So that's the first point. Like, yeah. I know that I was pitching up against people who were telling lies, and I know I'm too moral to run a marketing agency like that. So those are the two things that I know. The okay. second thing, the second thing is that... Um, if being an effective marketer is being able to understand a market and the needs of a market and deliver value against those needs, why can't marketing agencies, if they can't do it for themselves, 
how could they possibly start to imagine they can do it for a customer or a, a client? 100%, 100% agree, 100% agree. So the best agencies that I work with, how do they get most, the most of their clients after word of mouth? PPC. Agencies that really struggle, they don't use PPC. Hmm, this is interesting, isn't it? So agencies which are good at PPC use PPC to sell their agency because they know PPC works. But agencies who aren't doing well don't use PPC because it doesn't work. Oh, or maybe it doesn't work for them because they don't know how to use it. Very, very interesting. So we're back to if everyone's zigging, can you zag? You know, so we used to have a consultant who'd work with us called Rosemary, fantastic person. She used to turn up for pitches, yeah without any proposal in her hand and she used to say i can see from from the the list you know at reception that i'm the third person in pitching to you today um you know fully well that the 100 page proposal pack you had is exactly the same as all the other ones that give to people that they put your logo on it but what you're buying is me so why don't you ask me questions about me and how I can help you? Oh, and by the way, before we go any further, because I live on the Isle of Wight, any work that I do with you, I'd have to leave uh, by four o'clock in the afternoon. I could never be here before 10. She never lost a piece of work. She won everything she pitched for. And, and okay, we, you know, maybe there needs to be a new and more modern way of doing it, but it's this zig before you zag thing. It's, it's the, the pre-proposal phone call it's it's uh if you're going for a uh a tender document you're going for a you know an rtf um it's about disrupting the process you know, we don't talk to our you have to fill in our 50 page document can i talk to someone about about why you want this and why you want that uh yeah it, it, so we have to be cleverer at the marketing and selling of our agency where there is so much noise, but I would argue the really great agencies, you know, what are the really great agencies really good at? <laughs> You've answered it, Martin, they're really good at marketing themselves. Marketing, you know, look, for agencies, as well as for clients, marketing is not a battle of the product. Yeah. And the thing is that most agencies think it is a battle of the product. No, marketing is not a battle for the product. Marketing is a battle for the mind of the customer. Yeah. I believe my accountant is awesome, okay? I've got no proof of that because I only have one accountant at a time, but my accountant makes me think that he's, an awesome, he's awesome and therefore I love him. So agencies need to have this, this same understanding that, that it, it's a battle for the mind of the customer. And all the research says, unless you're talking to an FD, the decision-making, firstly, 90% of the decisions are made before they actually see you. And secondly, most of the decision making is, is, is not rational. I know we like to put it in our spreadsheet, but it's irrational. So why don't you flip the way you sell your agency to Mr. Client? How do you currently feel about, about digital marketing? I feel very uncomfortable. I don't know whether I'm getting value for money. Mr. Client, how would you like to feel about your, your, your digital marketing activity? I'd like to feel that I've got confidence that I can go to the uh, MD and the FD and deliver the results. And you just smile, look them in the eye and say, we can do that. And the interesting thing is that totally disarms them because most people are saying, we've got, here's our evidence, here's a proof, here's what we did before. We believe we can use these function points if we do 20% in Facebook and 30% in, in Bing and then the remainder in PPC. But if there's a, you know, you don't need to blind them with science. You just need to give them confidence that you can deliver. Okay, good. So I think, now I don't know if this is what I pitched. I don't remember. I don't think I had it quite as honed in my mind right now. But if I was pitching a client, at the, it, you know, I've sold for 27 years or something, embarrassing mm. amount of time. And the only way I've ever sold to anyone is by finding out exactly what it is that they wanted to buy yeah. and managing to position what I'm offering as that. Yeah. So, but if it were a pitch, it, I would never pitch. I'm never going to stand up and say, you should buy because of this, 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 this. But the principle for me now has to be about this delivering 
so if I say to people, if you're proactively marketing, you are in the business of buying customers. It's going to take some investment of time, energy, or money to acquire okay. those customers. I'm here to help you do that profitably. And the way we start is by understanding what it costs you to acquire a customer right now. 100% agree. tell people that, they fall over 100% of the time because they never even factored any of this cost in. I sacked one of my um, one of my c accountants because I asked him like, "What is it costing me to acquire a customer?" He was getting all the receipts, he was getting all the um, the um, expenses, he was getting everything. So it's like, so basically, I was saying to him, "What's my sales and marketing cost, and how many customers have I acquired?" Now he told me that was jargon, and that's why we we parted ways. So the pitch, if, the, if there is a pitch, should be literally that. You are paying far more than you could possibly imagine to acquire yeah. customers currently. I'm going to come, I'm going to let you know what that figure is, and then me and my people are going to work all day every day to reduce that number so you can have more profit in your business, you can take more money home to your family, live in a bigger house, take nicer holidays, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I never hear it. I never hear. It. I, um, I never see. Yeah. It. So I, again, I mean, I, when when you saw me way back in the day, I would have talked. I would have talked about because because the interesting thing is because I'm a bit of a marketing 101 guy. My I haven't changed what I say very much because I think it's still true. It's I think it's kind of evergreen truth. It's actually two things, isn't it? it and, and most people, most clients don't know it. Which is what is the cost of customer acquisition, and what is the lifetime value of a client so the lifetime so a client might be so it might cost you 100 pounds to acquire a client let's just say it's 100 pounds and the client might spend 100 pounds a year with you and the margin might be 30 percent so you make 30 pounds a year from the client but the client on average might stay with you for five years so the contribution is five times 30 which is 150 quid so therefore, it's costing you £100 to get £150. Now, the accountants don't like this because they like everything to be in, in, in years. But as long as the lifetime value of the client is less than the cost of customer acquisition, I can, I can go up to that point. And I, and I think that we haven't even factored in upsells, cross-sells, economies of scale, and so on and so forth. And I think that, that, that go to a lawyer, go to, an, go to any kind of potential client and say, I know because I've been to company's house and done done the math. I know how much typically someone in your industry what the cost of customer acquisition is. In fact, Google and Facebook give you access to that kind of information as well. And I can see from your accounts, which I've taken down from company's house, that it's how many clients do you think you made you got last year? Twenty five. Okay, I can see how much it cost you. And as you're saying, we can hand on heart pretty much guarantee that we can we can improve that number. And more importantly now, Mr. Customer, now as we try and really help your business, what is the lifetime value of a customer? And how can we help extend the lifetime? Value? Can we make uh, the typical lifetime value of a customer go from five to six years by, you know, bedding them in, keeping them in? And secondly, is it possible that the lifetime value of each year we could increase uh, by, by reducing the amount of friction that you're working with them? Because now what's happening is you're going from being a digital art digital marketing person to actually becoming more strategic and and my argument would be for agencies is that we need to get into the boardroom to add serious value because as soon as long as we're at the bottom of the digital marketing tree digga 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 dig, it's going to end up being commoditized and priced you know how much how much how much, uh, what percentage of Google AdWords spend do you charge? It's, it's all on price. But as soon as you're into the advice, one, you're adding significant value. But secondly, uh, uh, um, it, it's more profitable. But the main thing is you've got a choice about being a, a supplier. Hello, we got, we're doing £10,000 a year on PPC. Can you do it for us? Uh, an advisor. Um, we do 10000 per year on on Google PPC, could you just tell us what split you think we should be doing between which of our products? So now your advisor, thumbs up. And then the next level up, which is where I want you to be, trusted advisor, where they say, before we start next year, here's our product mix. 
and this is what we want to do with the business. How do you think we should be going about doing our marketing? How much do you think should be digital versus non-digital? Within the digital, what do you think the split should be between video and non-video? You, know, you want to be adding value at that level, not the pure, pure supplier level. And I think too many digital agencies think they should be a supplier and they shouldn't. They should be an advisor or a trusted advisor. Of course, of course. Okay, so there's two things, but I'm aware that we're coming to the end, so sure. there can't okay. be two things after every time you finish talking. The first thing is, I don't. It's a suck it and see process. Like so, basically, the only guarantees you can make, and absolutely 100%. I've never been in a business where you couldn't reduce their cost of customer acquisition because there is so much waste, and they're yep. investing nothing in retaining their customers yep. or cross selling. So, so it's always possible to increase the customer value and reduce the cost of customer acquisition. Those are the only things I'd ever be comfortable about guaranteeing. Sure. Other than that, it's kind of a suck it and see experimentations. Yeah. You can see what the clicks are going to cost. You can see what Google are telling the traffic is going to be like. Until you've got some skin in the game, you don't actually get to know the truth. Yeah. Okay, so there's all that thing. I've answered that thing. The second thing then is about agency. So does there always have to be an agency? Like could, okay, so probably the best example is you. How effective are you, because I haven't marketed myself for all my business for like six, seven years, and I'm doing it in the clunkiest way possible, in the most half-assed way possible, but I'm doing it at least, you know, it will sharpen up. But do you need an agency to market you? That's my question. Is it, how effective can you be at marketing yourself? I'm quite good at asking questions, aren't I? Yeah, in theory, Martin, the agency would be more up to speed and more efficient at doing it than you. However, there's a tremendous amount of friction between what you want and kind of what they deliver. So we, for ourselves, we have, we have someone in-house, but we also go out to agencies to help us with stuff. Uh, some of the agencies are fantastic because they know stuff we don't know and they're faster and quicker and incredibly good value for money. And some of them just don't seem to get what we're trying to do. Now, we're a low ticket business, um, but they, the, the poor agencies should have still said no. So yeah, you can do it yourself. I think, I think the answer is um, don't sign up to any of these uh, Get your agency to six figures in the next six weeks through these six tips type Facebook things because I think it is back to basics. But it is also, you know, deliver tons of really great content, be out there, be seen, be known. You know, I think, you know, I think business today is about trust. You know, so how do you how 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 do you evaluate trust? There's some clever clever formula about, you know, reliability, consistency, uh, honesty, divided by self, uh, self focus, you know, so the more people are talking about themselves, it's bad, the more they're talking about you, the more good it is. So I think, I think, um, if you can find an agency that works for you, they can deliver awesome value for money. Can you do it yourself? Is that really what you want to be doing? Don't you want to be running a restaurant? Yeah, so why don't you get someone else to do it? So, so I'm kind of, I, I, I'm slightly on the fence. I think for a small business, it's, it can be difficult to justify. And I think there's probably enough free or near to free tools and techniques to help you do it yourself. But as the business starts to grow, I think you probably need the expertise or by, by, by buy-in, you can employ them, you can have them get them on, Fiverr or uh, whatever sort of freelance freelancer, or you can go to a proper agency where you can put a brick through their window if they don't deliver. You know, you've got you've got choices. Good, that's real customer feedback. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. Oh man, I've got so many more things that I want to ask you, but we we really do need to stop. What we're talking about in principle here is a marketing proposition which is as quantifiable yes 
as all of the services that businesses know they need to buy and are comfortable buying because they are so quantifiable like yeah. legal services like accounting services like i don't know courier services like all of these things so it seems to me that there is something in this like if you could get this standardized and i understand that it's difficult or i don't you know we're going against a tsunami of bullshit which is basically continuously coming the other way propagated by business owners who don't take the trouble to know what it is that they're buying and agencies who like the fact that businesses don't know what they're buying yeah but it seems to me that you know we could fix this like now if people understood <laughs> this thing you know yeah. it's, it's a quantifiable valuable it's a quantifiable yes. value proposition okay and no one does it you know malcolm mcdonald at, at cranfield did research of I think a thousand businesses and discovered that roughly 1% of them actually offered a quantifiable value proposition, which is we do this for you, which means it will cost you this and you will get that, you know, yes. and we can do it. We can do it. We can look at our last 10 clients and say, you know, we work with businesses like yours in the last 10 clients we work with, they paid on average 10,000 pounds a month in return for which they got 1000 clicks, which equated to an additional 25,000 pounds of profit. And that's what you can expect when you buy from us, you know, so it's a quantifiable value proposition, but instead we like to go, we like, we just, we just back off, you know, when the client says, have you got any skin in the game? Would you like, would you like to, to do payment on results? Most agencies go, oh, no. So we don't mind you paying us to do it, but we haven't, we're not prepared to put any skin in the game of, of doing it results based because we're not that convinced about what we do. I don't know if, if this is true, but I'm still telling people, um, but there was a statistic that the um, average lifespan of a digital marketing agency client in London was three months. Yeah, it's probably true. And, and the tragedy of course, is it takes that amount of time to actually figure out what the hell you're doing for the client. But yeah. um, there is there's a lot of swapping around and moving around, especially because because it's do I want, do I want to, does this agency do Google? Does it also do Bing? Does it do TikTok? Does it do Facebook? Does it do Facebook video? Should we be doing video? Um, again, I'm, I, I'm arguing that those are actually kind of the wrong the wrong questions because tactics is secondary to strategy and strategy is secondary to what the customer really wants but certainly a lot of agencies find that it goes very very you know that they they don't stay very long they're not very sticky okay and this goes to which is another whole can of worms which we can't get into which is the other thing that you're saying is about what the customer wants and for me part of the issue is half of the issue is that customers don't actually know what they want from their marketing they get a sense that they should be doing this like they're doing, a, I, th that's that's the sense I get. Man, we've gone for an hour and 20 minutes already, so we're going to have to stop. Um, I've loved this. I've really thoroughly enjoyed this. Thank you so much. My pleasure. I've talked a bit too much, but my, my heart pressure has been quite high today, so I apologise if I've cut across you. <laughs> <laughs> it's only a pleasure. The trouble, <sighs> the difficulty's been is that we agree 100% on absolutely everything, cool. and I've had to be saying things I don't agree with, which I don't really <laughs> enjoy. Um <laughs> So, man, thank you so much for this. Um, here's the final question. Who else should I be talking to? Who else has got something interesting and useful to say on this subject you think that might be interested to talk to me? I would talk to Barnaby Winter. Barnaby Winter. Yeah, Barnaby Winter. And I think it is, I think the, the address is that Barnaby Winter. He's a... Okay. A general marketing guy he's worked with just about every brand there is but he's got a down-to-earth absolutely down-to-earth approach to understanding what the customer wants and how we give it to them fantastic thank you so much is there anything you wanted to say that you haven't said no oh uh, if you're a digital agency put your prices up just put your prices up um and i think we'll stop there <laughs> Okay, and if they are a digital agency and they are looking to do better, then they should come seek you out. So you are Robert oh, Craven. Um, so it's well, the best best place is RC, which stands for Robert Craven at 
GIDA initiative, so G-Y-D-A, which stands for Grow Your Digital Agency, GIDAinitiative.com, all one word. So RC at GIDAinitiative.com will get to us. Fantastic. I can't tell you how pleased I am that, that we've had this conversation. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. You've confirmed Brilliant. everything I believe. You've given me energy to go on <laughs> and further spread the word. Yeah. We are not alone. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it feels like I'm alone and it feels like you didn't really pile in with a huge amount of enthusiasm when I said we could fix it. I will soldier on alone, Robert. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks a lot, Marty. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Okay, cheerio.